<clears throat> Hi all, this is Dr. Jess Stratford. Welcome to um, Wilkes University Ecology Bio 344. This lecture is Behavioral Ecology, and this is going to be in three parts. This part is going to cover the introduction and foraging ecology. When we look to explain certain behaviors, any behavior, this could be uh, ants foraging in a forest. The example I like to think of is uh, why birds migrate. And if you look at explanations, you can think of um, categorizing these explanations into to two very different things. One is the proximate explanation. And proximate has to do at the individual level. Okay. So why does a particular bird migrate? An example I think of is uh, Baltimore Oriole, and that's because um, they nest in the tree in my neighborhood and in the summertime between May and say September. And in September, to April, you'll see them in uh, Central America. And um, so they do this amazing behavior, which is they fly from Pennsylvania to Costa Rica. And the question is why, why do that? So the, the proximate explanation would be if you, if you could examine one Oriole and say, why are you doing this? Um, that would be the explanation. And so for Baltimore Orioles, what happens is when daylight decreases, it triggers in them uh, this behavior to fly south, okay? And then when they're in Costa Rica, when day length is increasing, then they know it's time to fly north. So that's the individual level, right? And so, uh, let's say you're an ant foraging in the forest, it would be to go find food because you are driven uh, to go find food, whatever neurons, the way they're constructed in their brains, tell them to go out and go find food. Ultimate causes. Is things that occur at the species level. and essentially why that characteristic exists in that species. And when we think about ultimate things, we tend to think about things like natural selection, right? So traits, I mean, behaviors can be something that evolve as a response to natural selection. And uh, we often don't think about them in terms of drift, but they should be, uh, drift should also play a role, right? And, uh, but natural selection, we think of most behaviors as most traits being, um, natural selection, be able to act on them, particularly if that trait is heritable, right? So if a behavior is heritable, right? So there are dream genes that determine like migratory behavior. All right, so uh, behaviors, and particularly if we're looking at ultimate explanations, not only natural selection, but I wanna add in something here called phylogenetic inertia. And what is that? So, if we were to look at Orioles, and I don't know the phylogeny of Orioles, but if, if this is a phylogeny, so this represents the, the uh, relationships of Orioles, and let's say Baltimore Oriole occurs on here, there's a closely related species in Pennsylvania called the Orchard Oriole. And there's other species, there's uh, Bullox and Altamira and all kinds of species of or Orioles in North America. And let's just call these others. 
Okay. So this is a whole tree of Orioles. And if uh, migration occurred is so is common among all these species, right? Then we can infer that migration actually occurred before even Baltimore Orioles existed. So this is a trait that was inherited. I call that phylogenetic inertia because it's not in Baltimore Orioles, migration was not shaped by natural selection. They just inherited that trait, just like being um, orange and black, right? All right. So let's get rid of this. All right, next. My notes are gone. Nope, they're right here. All right. So that's an introduction to behavioral ecology. You just know that it's a trait. It's what, what's what organisms do, right? It's how they respond to stimuli, how they interact with each other. It's subject to natural selection or it can be inherited. That's the big thing. And then realize that any, any behavior you observe, there's two types of explanation. The proximate one that's, that's driving it and a historical reason why that uh, trait exists in that species. All right, now specifically, let's look at foraging behavior. Okay, so foraging behavior is when you go out and look for food, simply. Uh, some species, uh, particularly filter feeders, there's not really a foraging behavior because you're kind of stuck in one spot. spot. So what I'm talking about is uh, foraging behaviors where animals are actually to move about the landscape. And the big driver of this is something called optimal foraging. There's a lot of work in optimal foraging, a lot of research. And um, what, what does that mean? It means that animals are maximizing uh, fitness and energy when they go out and forage. And so by maximizing fitness, that means they want to do those things that have the the best return in terms of their own fitness and producing offspring. And I put in here energy because often the currency is energy. So they go out and find food and bring it back or they'll eat on the spot. But these two things can be at odds because if you're going out and searching for food, you could be um, like if you're a groundhog and you have to leave your burrow, you can now be predated on. So there are risks to going out and foraging. And what you want to do is maximize uh, any behaviors is going to maximize, in the end, fitness, right? But the currency is often what we think of as energy. So part of looking at optimal foraging is uh, the net energy out of a behavior or a foraging strategy. And so that is going to equal the total energy you get out of that. So if you're a Baltimore Oriole and uh, you're going to go out and look for caterpillars, okay? So when I say energy gross, it's not that eating caterpillars is gross. Gross means that's the total energy you got from eating caterpillars, okay? We're going to divide that by two things. One is handling.
and the other is search. Okay. So you kind of get this when you are um, looking at a bird feeder. So here the search is really minimal because birds know where the feeder is. But if you watch any bird grab, and, and this is the same for you as well, unless you're weird and just eat sunflowers whole, if you watch a bird at eat sunflower seeds, they'll roll them around in their mouth and get it positioned just right, press down, crack the seed, then with their tongue, they'll actually grab the, uh, the inside, the endosperm, and then the uh, seed drops out, the uh, husk. And then searching could be if you're a fox, uh, you may spend a lot of time looking for food, say looking for a mouse, but when you catch the mouse, you just gulp it right down. So that would have low handling time, but a lot of search time to find that mouse. Okay. Or you can think of as um, a, um, a vulture where there's no time handling, you're just eating dead things, but it may take you a long time to find something dead to eat. Okay. And of course, there's some middle ground where things like your Baltimore Oriole is flying around searching for caterpillars. And when it finds it, you all, they like the tent caterpillars, it'll have to tear apart the tent, grab a caterpillar. And sometimes they'll actually wipe the caterpillar on a branch because a lot of caterpillars have stinging hairs and it will actually remove the stinging hairs by wiping the caterpillar on the branch and then gobble it up that way, okay? So, I want to present to you a graph. So let me make some room here. Graph showing optimal foraging with these variables. Okay. So I can actually draw a box. And let's get my lines back. And we're gonna say time and I think your book calls it effort. And then energy will be on the Y. Okay. And what you have here is one model will look like this. So as you go out, uh, and start looking, your investment will always go up and it's kind of goes up like this. Okay. And what happens is, so that's the, that's the investment. So that can only go up. So you can only spend energy flying from branch to branch looking for caterpillars, right? If you're an ant crawling on the ground, you can only spend energy, right? So it always is increasing. What you get out looks like this, right? And what this is, is energy gained, okay? Let me pick a different color here. So investment is energy out, energy gain is a positive. If we look at the difference between these two, okay, it'll look something like this. So this line is your net energy. Okay, so that line represents the difference between your, your costs and your benefits, okay? And it's maximized at some point here, okay? And it'll depend on how much you invest and how much energy you, you gain specifically, but this is like a generic graph. And for each species, 
these lines might have slightly different slopes, but you're still looking at the difference between them. So some species it may be down here and some species it may be up here. Whatever species this is, this generic graph, it is right here. So it, it's very minimal here, it's very minimal here, and it's maximized here. That's why we get this peak of net energy. The energy gain looks like this because if you think about uh, if you're Baltimore Oriole and you're going about and you find a caterpillar here, a caterpillar here, you're gaining energy, right? Maybe you find more if you were to search a little bit faster. But you can imagine a point where you're working your fastest and you may happen upon like a tent caterpillar that's just full with caterpillars. You can only eat and consume so many at some maximum rate, right? It's like popcorn. When you have a bucket of popcorn at the movie theater, there's just some maximal rate you would eat and then more than that, you would choke or you just can't fit it in your mouth, whatever. Um, it's an interesting idea, but uh, at some point you're gonna maximize and no matter how much more investment you put in, you won't be able to increase the energy get out because you've, you've already hit that threshold and you're just kind of coasting along. So this is, this is the uh, marginal, what we call the marginal value theorem. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is the marginal value theorem. I need some space here. Marginal value theorem. And this was developed by Eric Charnov. I it was the 1970s. 1976. And so let's uh, let's draw this graph and it takes uh, quite a bit of explanation. So let's put in our axes. <coughs> and then um, the label. So we're gonna look at energy. And this bottom one's going to be time. If you remember that as you uh, invest energy, it's going to go up and then be maximized. Okay. So let's start there. So this is just saying that at some point you're going to have what's called diminishing returns. That no matter how much energy you're gonna put in, you basically maximize how much you're gonna get out. So it levels off, the energy gained levels off, but there's a relatively steep increase. So as you go out looking for food, you'll find it. And if you put in more food looking, I mean, more time looking for food, you'll find more food, okay? But at some point it levels off. So <clears throat> we start this graph, uh, out here and we don't start it at zero because we assume that the animal is not in the patch. Okay. So it's gonna have to travel to the patch. And the question is, at what time should you give up? Okay. And what you do is you draw lines that are tangent to uh, this curve. And so if you, if you're, I'll, let's have two points. So you can start at this point. And so your travel time to the patch is, this is short distance or short time. And then you can have another one out here. And that travel time is, is much better. So for example, if you're a Baltimore Oriole, like I said, they like these uh, tent caterpillars to get in there, tear it up and then start pulling out the tent caterpillars. And the question is, at what time should, and, and remember these tent caterpillars, you tear it apart 
and initially it's it's very easy to get the caterpillars out but eventually uh you're going to empty it out and then you basically have to search around caterpillar poo and the web to find more caterpillars okay or uh we tested not me but i uh read a paper where they tested the uh, risk a baboon was willing to take. And what they did is they took a bucket and they mixed in peanuts in with wood chips. So um, the baboons had to search the wood chips to find the peanuts. So initially, they're pretty easy to find, but then you have to search through more wood chips to find those peanuts, right? And at some point, since baboons would be foraging on the ground, you got to watch your back for leopards. You need to get out of there and go find a place uh, that's that's going to be rewarding, right? So the question is, at what point do you stop foraging in a patch and go on to other patches? Okay. So think about uh, like a raccoon's going to look for crayfish or something in a stream, and at some point it needs to stop flipping rocks and go look somewhere else. Okay. So he finds a few crayfish here and there. And then at some point he's going to say, I'm not finding anymore. I need to go on. But maybe it's not that you're not finding anymore or there's none there. It's just that the time it takes to flip even more rocks to find those few remaining aren't worth it. And you're better off just finding a new spot to forage. Okay. So again, this, this model is going back to that uh, H to handling time plus search time. So this is looking at the effect of the, the time between patches. So slightly different take on all this. The way to find the, the time to move on, right? So the time to move on is gonna be on this side. And this is the time it takes to get to a patch. So you arrive at a patch here, okay? So travel time to the patch and then leaving the patch. And the question is at what time? That is uh, the line that's tangent, okay? Uh, with with the intercept being here. So let me get uh, another color. So let's get green. And so uh, to find the line tangents, it's almost as if you were to uh, put the stick at that one, uh, the leaving point and just let it drop and hit the curve. So a tangent line it's gonna look something like this, right? So you're just dropping the stick. And where it, where it hits, that's the time at which you uh, wanna leave a patch, okay? So if you have a short distance between patches, you can basically just get the easy peanuts and move along, get the easy peanuts and move along. But if you are starting at a, uh, if the distance between your patches is very long, okay? So you, you have buckets of peanuts um, and you're a baboon and the, now the buckets are spaced even further apart. What you wanna do is, again, it's predicted if you draw a line that's tangent, again, I'm trying to draw lines here. It's gonna be up here. And again, this is short distance, long distance. You can think of this as a commute between patches. And what this tells you is basically, let's call this A and this B. So A has a short commute, you leave sooner. So A, you give up sooner, okay? And for B, since this is time, B, you give up later. So if the distances between your patches as it gets longer, you should stay longer sort of extract as much as from that patch as possible, okay, before moving on. Uh, what you don't wanna do is stay 
beyond the asymptote because you're staying longer and you're not getting any more, there's no more energy gain. Okay, so you definitely want to stop before you asymptote, but uh, for that will depend on the distance between your patches. Okay, and so uh, we can test these things. Let's, uh, let's get rid of all this. I love the eraser. Okay. There's something called giving up density. And so giving up density is almost like the time spent in a patch, but the giving up density is kind of flipping around. And you say, at what point does your food density get too low that you, you leave? And um, so this is something you can test um, without observing the animals. So if uh, the time thing, you would actually have to watch a, an animal enter a patch and then time it. Giving up density is kind of cool because you can set this up experimentally very easily. And um, so something that I've, I've worked on with uh, Dr. Steele is uh, you can take a pan and fill it with sand and put in sunflower seeds. You could either count them out or just weigh them. And you can, you can alter the landscape right, the risk, and uh, squirrels will come in and dig through the sand and eat these sunflower seeds, but at some point, you are finding the last couple seeds, you're also exposed to predators, so at some point, you should say, like, this is not worth it, right, and you get out of there. Um, so guds, the giving up density, so GUDS is what we call this, something like this. And then in the, uh, in the baboon study, what they did is they had peanuts and mixed in with wood chips. And so the baboons would have to go in the five gallon bucket and uh, look for the peanuts that way. But GUDS are a common way to uh, experimentally test some ideas of, uh, how long organisms stay in the patch or take off, okay? And what <clears throat> Dr. Steele is doing is he's using GUDS to do something called um, looking at the, what's now called the landscape of fear, okay? So landscape of fear isn't just sort of squirrels and eating acorns, it's that all behaviors have a cost. Some of it is the, the moving cost and some of it is risk of predation. So uh, a hawk, if, uh, if there's a squirrel in the middle of the field with no trees around, that's gonna be much easier prey. So its risk is very high and it's pro probably a very nervous squirrel. A squirrel in the middle of a forest is gonna be not so nervous. Uh, and we can measure that sort of at what point does it become less afraid or more afraid by using these guts. But the landscape of fear is very, very important for forest dynamics. And this also um, works for birds as well, because birds will move about the landscape and in some landscapes are more wary and they'll spend more time looking around than searching for insects. All right, so we can, or not we can, but uh, animals out foraging, they can mitigate um, predation risk. So what we've seen is they can avoid certain habitats. So one interesting study looked at moose and moose like to spend their time foraging along streams, but when there's wolves, the moose will avoid streams because they know that's where the moose are looking for them. Um, they can avoid uh, times, 
And what I mean by that is if you look at mice and their activity, they're often way more um, active at night where they're not as easily seen by hawks. Of course, they're seen by owls, but there's fewer nocturnal predators than there are diurnal predators. Uh, there may be social behaviors. So if you think of the classic mammals that are prey like zebras, gnus, a cape buffalo, these things often have social behaviors Well, they'll travel in groups and things like cape buffalo will actually uh, go on the attack as, as a group and uh, fend off uh, from lions. And then birds, we know that there's flocking behavior. Okay, so flocking herds and then flocking probably herds as well with flocking there's also birds give warning calls and uh, will let other birds know that there's a, a predator around and there's I have here many other uh, behaviors to mitigate predation so you can you can do things like act aggressively towards predators uh, you can run that's pretty simple that's very common of course uh, but there's many ways to uh, mitigate predation risk, and often these are at odds with foraging. So think about when you're thinking about behaviors that they have a, a benefit, which is you're getting energy, and they have a cost, which is predation risk. And many of these things, um, such as uh, looking out for predators, takes away from your time eating. So um, predation risk. Um, really modifies um, how animals behave, right? And they'll act very differently when there's no predators around. Okay, that's the end of this section. And then next we'll do mating behavior. Oh boy. All right. See you soon.